Welcome back BioMonsters. Today we're going to be focusing on a new tool called a dihybrid cross. And a dihybrid cross is going to be used pretty much the same way we use a monohybrid cross. The only difference is, is if you look at this prefix, instead of focusing on one trait at a time, our dihybrid crosses are going to be focusing on two traits. So a dihybrid cross is a tool that we use when we're trying to follow the transmission of two specific traits from one generation to the next when we have known genotypes for our parents. So let's go ahead and dive in and see how we actually use this new tool. So let's revisit Mendel's peas. Now, so far when we've talked about Mendel and simple Mendelian genetics, we focus on the transmission of just a single trait from one generation to the next. So our example could be that we've talked about, we could discuss, for example, seed color. And we can say that when we're looking at seed color, it's either going to be green, and we can use a capital G for that because it's dominant, or it's going to be yellow, and if it's yellow, we're going to use a lowercase g because it's recessive. Or we've also focused on another trait. We've also focused on the height of a pea plant, or Mendel did when he did his experiment. And when we was looking at height, he was looking at peas that were either tall, and we're going to use a capital T for that because it's dominant, or we were looking at the alternate version of that particular trait, um, which would be short. And for short, we would use a capital T because it's recessive. Remember, when Mendel was doing his work, he was focusing on each of these traits individually. So for a monohybrid cross, this would be one cross focusing specifically on seed color. And this would be our second cross focusing specifically on height. But what if we wanted to predict the outcome of both traits at the same time? So what if we wanted to see seed color and height and watch them move from one generation to the next at the same time to be able to predict what our babies are going to look like in terms of color of the seed as well as height? So let's go ahead and see um, what an example might look like. So here's our word problem. Remember, whenever we have word problems, the very first thing that we want to do is hammer it out. So let's go ahead and read carefully using our reading strategies. So it says we want to cross one pea plant that is heterozygous. Remember, heterozygous means different. So we have two different letters for both seed color as well as height. Because remember, we're looking at two traits at once. And then we're going to cross that pea plant with another one that is homozygous dominant for both traits. And remember, when we say homozygous dominant, we're talking about the same letters that are all going to be capital in nature because dominant is always going to be a capital letter. So we've hammered it out. The next thing that we need to do is make ourselves a key. So I'm going to go ahead and make myself a key right here and you can find room on your paper to make a key as well. I know that I'm dealing with seed color and I'm dealing with height as well. So I'm going to make a key for color first. And I know, based on what we just talked about, that if something is green in color, it's going to be a capital G. If it's yellow in color, it's going to be a lowercase g because that's the recessive form of that particular trait. And I also know that we're looking at height in this particular word problem. So again, I'm going to use the information that I gleaned uh, from our previous discussion. So we're going to have tall pea plants. And if they're tall, it's going to be a capital T. And we're also going to have short pea plants. And if the pea plants are short, we're going to use a lowercase t. So here's my key. The last thing that I need to do is I have to find my parents. So I'm going to go back up into my word problem and I'm going to read, here's parent one. Parent one is heterozygous for seed color and seed height. And so I'm going to go ahead and do P1 here. And I'm going to write down what that genotype actually looks like. So heterozygous, so it's going to be one capital, one lowercase, but that's true for both traits. So I'm going to go down here and look at my key. If I'm capital and lowercase for color, I'm going to be a big G, lowercase g. And if I'm also heterozygous, so capital and lowercase for height, I'm going to be a big T, lowercase t. So that's parent number one. Now I need to find parent number two. So parent number two, if I read through, it says parent number two is homozygous dominant, so capital, two capital letters for both traits. So I'm going to be big G, big G, and big T, big T. So the next thing that we need to figure out is what are we going to do with these parents? So parent number one, remember, is big G, little g, big T, little t. And if you remember this setup right here, we said that they're both, they're heterozygous 
for both traits, which we talked about before. And then parent number two is big G, big G, big T, big T. And from what we mentioned before, remember this means that it is, they were homozygous dominant for both traits. So let's go ahead and look what we need to do next. So now that we have our parents, the next thing that we need to do is we actually have to figure out gamete combinations. And this is the tricky part when we're doing dihybrid crosses. This is where people usually get mixed up. So if this is parent number one, I need to figure out what the sex cells or the gametes are going to look like or what the possible combinations are for each one of the gametes that parent number one could create. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to use the FOIL method, just like you do in algebra class. So all we're going to do is we're going to take our big G and we're going to multiply it by the next allele or, or the next allele for the next trait. So that's going to be combination number one. It's going to be big G big T, so that's one allele, or I'm sorry, one gamete combination. Here's another option to multiply big G by the little t. So that's my second possible gamete combination, so it's going to be big G, little t. But now I need to look at this little guy right here. So I'm going to multiply big G times little, t, or I'm sorry, little G times big T. So our third gamete combination is little G, big T. And then I can also take this guy and multiply it by the last letter in the next trait, which is going to be our fourth gamete combination, which is little g, little t. So these are my gamete combinations, my possible combinations for parent number one. Now I need to do the same thing for parent number two. So I'm going to FOIL again. I'm going to multiply the outside by the first letter of the next uh, trait. So my first gene combination is going to be big G, big T. Now I'm going to do it again for the outside. So my second gamete combination is going to be big G, big T. And now I'm going to look at my next G. So for my next G, I'm going to multiply this and this. So my third gamete combination, possible combination, is big G, big T. And then lastly, I'm going to do it one more time by the outside. And what's unique about this particular uh, genotype, you'll notice that all the gamete combinations are exactly the same because they are homozygous dominant. So now that I have my gamete combinations, I'm able to do the very last step. All right, so what you're looking at right now is a Punnett square for a dihybrid cross. And we know that this is a Punnett square for a dihybrid cross because anytime we use, we need to do a dihybrid cross, we're always going to use a Punnett square that has 16 boxes because we have to have room for all four gamete combinations for each parent. So now that I've set up my box and I know that 16 quadrants, or I'm sorry, 16 spaces, so I know that this is a dihybrid cross, I need to go ahead and throw in my parents. And remember, your parents are still going to go on the top and they're also going to go on the side. But this time we're going to be placing them in there in their possible gamete combinations. So here are my possible gamete combinations for parent one. So I put, just so there's no confusion, this is going to be parent number one for me. And again, it doesn't matter where you put them. And I'm going to put parent number two along the side. So here are my gamete combinations for parent number two. Now the next thing I'm going to do is the same thing that I always do. Whatever's on the left hand side comes into the box and whatever's on top comes into the box. But then I need to sort them once they're actually inside of those boxes. So I'm going to sort them by putting my letters together in alphabetical order and also capitals always go before lowercase. So let me show you what that looks like in my first box. So in my first box I'm going to bring down my big G bring over my big G, and then put in my two capital T's. So I put my T's together and I put my G's together. I'm going to keep doing that for all of my other boxes. So if I go through here, I have a big G, big G, big T, little t. My little t has to come after my capital T because we're still going to follow the same rules that we follow for a monohybrid cross. And I'm going to keep on going and filling it in. And as I fill it in, you go ahead and do the same on your paper. You 
filled in your Punnett square correctly, it should look just like mine that I have on the screen. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and write in the phenotypes because I like to do that. It helps me process the information in my Punnett square a lot easier when I have to then go ahead and answer questions about probability or ratios. So if I look here, I'm going to think about my key that I wrote down, big G, big G, so I know that it's going to be green. And big T, big T means it's going to be tall. So this is all going to be green and tall. And because these are all exactly the same, it's going to be true for this box as well. So green and tall, green and tall, green and tall. In my next uh, box, I have big G, big G. So I know that's still going to be green. And then big T, little T. And remember, we're still following Mendelian genetics. So this is dominant. So we won't see this little guy. So this is still going to be tall. So all of these boxes are also going to be green and tall because the genotypes are exactly the same. In my next box, I'm still going to have big G, little g. So again, I'm still going to be green. And I have big T, big T, so I'm going to be tall again. And these are all going to be the same. And lastly, I'm going to have a green um, seed color. And also, we're still going to be tall. So all of these are going to be the same. So even though we have different genotypes here, different genotype combinations, you'll notice that all the phenotypes are exactly the same, which sometimes happen when you do a monohybrid cross or a dihybrid cross. Now that you have all that information, you should be able to, if given a series of questions like to tell us what is the probability of getting offspring with these two parents that have yellow seeds. And based on the dihybrid cross that we just did, you know that the probability would be 0% because none of our offspring have little g little g and that's the only way to be yellow in seed color all right good luck guys if you have any other questions about dihybrid crosses come and see me i'll be more than happy to give you some more practice problems